Hey kids, miss me? Welcome to uh, a new exciting episode of Pulp Today. I took a few weeks off to get COVID. Vodka's a good uh, treatment for COVID, you know that? It's really not. Uh, but it didn't kill me. Um, we, me, me, and, me and Fred Nietzsche can, uh, can have an argument someday, that's not how it's pronounced, about whether it made me stronger. But I'm back and uh, drinking and reading for you, as I was before. Mm. I'll be drinking more. Um, today's book, did you miss me? I already asked that. The birds missed me, but we're not doing Hitchcock or uh, Daphne du Maurier. That's who wrote the book, The Birds, right? Not doing either of them this time. We're doing Laura. Uh, famously the face in the misty night of popular song. And Gene Tierney in the movie. Uh, someday maybe I'll do a movie podcast. But I, and I will inevitably talk about the movie. But we're here to talk about books. Vera Caspery, who wrote the book, had one of those interesting, messy, early to mid 20th century lives, born in uh, 1899. Uh, wrote for Hollywood, wrote stage plays, wrote a few books, um, managed to maintain a certain degree of independence from the system while also working within it. She, uh, she flirted with communism a little bit, as a lot of uh, intelligent and sensitive people did in the teens and 20s. Um, Takes her until Hitler and uh, Stalin sign the non-aggression pact in '39 to become disillusioned with the whole thing. But she, she maintains a, a certain fascination with the ideology, even if its real-world uh, applications are incredibly disappointing to her and so many of her generation. But it also leads to a little bit of gray listing le later in her career, and I think uh, she was never involved enough to be blacklisted. Uh, her her connections to the party were pretty uh, limited, but it's hard not to think there would be more Vera Caspery movies, novels, etc. Uh, had she not been uh, derailed a little bit by that. Uh, but to the novel, this is a classic. Uh, I saw the movie first uh, when I was a teenager. Teenager liked old movies, and. Uh, and also at the time was uh, in junior high. I was in. Uh, I had an unrequited love named Laura, so I was, you know, the material appealed to me. <laughs> Laura Meisenhelter, by the way, now happily married. It all worked out for everybody, but you know, uh, at the time, devastating. Um, this is a, a paperback from the '60s, I think. Yeah, '66. The story is originally published in '42. The movie's from 44, uh, so obviously Hollywood jumped on it pretty quick. The book has a nice, uh, it's broken into five parts, all with different narrators. I think parts two and five are the same narrator, uh, and one of them is just a transcript of a police interrogation. It's, but it's a, it's a, for its time, for 42, it's, a, it's an interesting structure. I mean, one repeated a million times by other writers later, but it's an interesting structure for this. And uh, part one is narrated by Waldo Lidecker, an incredibly indelible and well-written character performed in the movie by Clifton Webb, and I will do my best not to slide into a very bad impression of him. Chapter one. The city that Sunday morning was quiet. Those millions of New Yorkers who, by need or preference, remain in the town over a summer weekend had been crushed spiritless by humidity. Over the island hung a fog that smelled and felt like water in which too many soda water glasses have been washed. Sitting at my desk, pen in hand, I treasured the sense that, among those millions, only I, Waldo Lidecker, was up and doing. The day just passed, devoted to shock and misery, had stripped me of sorrow. Now I had gathered strength for the writing of Laura's epitaph. My grief at her sudden and violent death found consolation in the thought that my friend, had she lived to a ripe old age, would have passed into oblivion, whereas the violence of her passing and the genius of her admirer gave her a fair chance at immortality. My doorbell rang. 
Its electric vibrations had barely ceased when Roberto, my Filipino manservant, came to tell me that Mr. McPherson had asked to see me. Mark McPherson, I exclaimed, and then, without trepidation, I bade Roberto ask Mr. McPherson to wait. Mohammed had not rushed out to meet the mountain. The visit was a not, of a not unimportant member of the police department, although I am still uncertain of his title or office, conferred a certain honor. Lesser folk are unceremoniously questioned at headquarters, but what had young McPherson to do with the murder? His triumphs were concerned with political rather than civil crime. In the case of the people of New York versus Associated Dairymen, his findings had been responsible, or so the editorial writers said, for bringing down the price of milk a penny a quart. A senatorial committee had borrowed him for an investigation of labor rackets, and only recently his name had been offered as leader of a national inquiry into defense profits. Screened by the half-open door of my study, I watched him move restlessly about my drawing room. He was the sort of man I saw at once who affects to scorn affectation, a veritable Cassius, who emphasized the lean and hungry look by clothing himself darkly in blue worsted, unadorned white shirt, and dull tie. His hands were long and tense, his face slender, his eyes watchful, his nose a direct inheritance from those dour ancestors who had sniffed sin with such constancy that their very nostrils had become aggressive. He carried his shoulders high and walked with taut erectness as if he were careful of being watched. My drawing room irritated him. To a man of his fiercely virile temperament, the delicate perfection must be cloying. It was audacious, I admit, to expect appreciation. Was it not slightly optimistic of me to imagine that good taste was responsible for the concentration with which he studied my not unworthy collection of British and American glassware? I noted that his scowl was fixed upon a shining object, one of my peculiar treasures. Habit, then, had made him alert to detail. On the mantel of Laura's living room he had, no doubt, observed the partner to my globe and pedestal vase of mercury glass. He stretched his hand toward the shelf. I leaped like a mother leopard. Careful, young man. That stuff's priceless. He turned so sharply that the small rug slid along the polished floor. As he steadied himself about against the cabinet, porcelain and glass danced upon the shelves. A bull in a china shop, I remarked. The pun restored my humor. I extended my hand. He smiled mechanically. I'm here to talk about the Laura Hunt case, Mr. Lidecker. Naturally. Have a seat. He settled his long frame carefully upon a frail chair. I offered cigarettes from a Haviland casket, but he pulled out a pipe. You're supposed to be quite an authority on crime yourself, Mr. Lidecker. What do you think about this business? I warmed. No writer, however popular, disdains a reader, however humble. I'm honored to know that you read, and more anon. Only when my paper happens to open to the page. The affront was not displeasing. In the world I frequent, where personality is generously exposed and friendship offered without reticence, his aloofness struck an uncommon note. I offered my charm. You may not be a Lidecker fan, Mr. McPherson, but I confess that I followed your career with breathless excitement. You ought to know enough not to believe everything you read in the papers, he said dryly. I was not to be discouraged. Isn't criminal investigation a bit out of your line, a trifle unimportant for a man of your achievements? I've been assigned to the case. Office politics? Except for the perp perp of his pipe, the room was silent. The month is August, I mused. The commissioner is off on his holiday. The deputy commissioner has always been resentful of your success, and since retail murder is somewhat out of fashion these days, and usually, after the first sensation, relegated to page two or worse, he has found a convenient way of diminishing your importance. The plain truth, if you want to know it, he was obviously annoyed with himself for bothering to give an excuse, is that he knew I wanted to see the Dodgers play the Braves yesterday afternoon. I was enchanted. From trifling enmities do great adventures grow. Great adventures. A two-timing dame gets murdered in her flat. So what? A man did it. Find the man. Believe me, Mr. Lidecker, I'm seeing the game this afternoon. The killer himself couldn't stop me. Pained by his vulgar es estimate of my beloved Laura, I spoke mockingly. Baseball, eh? 
No wonder your profession has fallen upon evil days. The great detectives neither rested nor relaxed until they had relentlessly tracked down their quarry. I'm a working man. I've got hours like everybody else. And if you expect me to work overtime on this third-class mystery, you're thinking of a couple of other guys. Crime doesn't stop because it's Sunday. I'll leave it there. I could kind of go on with that forever because Waldo Lidecker is such an amazing character. It's so well written. Uh, and yeah, those cadences, that was... Uh, it, 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 it did immediately devolve into a Clifton Webb impression. Um, interestingly, in the film, he uh, receives McPherson in the bath. Uh, and... Where that comes from is later on you learn that the first detective that interviewed Lidecker found him in the bath and he did not get up from the bathtub to talk to the guy. And I can understand why the screenplay adapter, whichever of the ones who did it, uh, made that decision, thought that was just too priceless a thing to leave out of the movie. Uh, also worth mentioning in the backstory of the movie that um, Clifton Webb, who played the part, hadn't appeared in a film since 1925. And this is 1944. It is believed he was blackballed out of the industry because of his homosexuality. Uh, the sexuality of Waldo Lidecker is a little interesting in the book. It is possible to read him as uh, a lovesick old bachelor who is in love with a young woman. Or it's possible to leave, read him as a gay man with a beautiful best friend that he does not think the man exists who is good enough for her. Uh, one of the men in the movie not good enough for her is Vincent Price, who I was very lucky to write for earlier this year, at, albeit as a ghost in a comic book. Um, but Vera Casper, Laura, it's a terrific book. I recommend it highly. Uh, it's a very entertaining read, as I hope uh, I have somewhat conveyed to you. Uh, one story on a personal note, uh, for those who came in late, my father, Michael Avaloni, was a hard-boiled private eye writer, among other things, and a member of the Mystery Writers of America. And uh, he was at a MWA cocktail party, I think in the 60s sometime, Mystery Writers of America, MWA, and uh, Vera Caspery was in the room, and he walked over and introduced himself to her by saying, it's really great to meet you, I'm Mark McPherson. And she said, but of course you are, darling. <laughs> uh, which is so classically my father. Mm. Identifying himself as the detective hero from her novels. Um, I also couldn't help notice in the, the, <laughs> the description of McPherson that I am also I am wearing exactly uh, what he is described as wearing in the, in the book, which was not intentional. I didn't read this piece before I... Uh, I was familiar enough with the first few pages. I didn't reread it before recording this, but uh, go out and get the book. Um, watch the movie if you get a chance. It's terrific. Um, some kind of awkward lyrics were put to its beautiful main title theme, but, uh, you know, Sinatra can put it over. And uh, on that note, see you next week. COVID be damned. Thanks for listening. <laughs>